Hello, seventh graders. This is Mr. Shear, and if you're looking at your screen, you might be able to guess that today's topic is about the fur trade. And a lot of this has to do with the Pacific Northwest, a lot of this has to do with Canada, um, and a lot of this is not necessarily specific to Washington, but just a larger overview of kind of a history of the fur trade in the North American continent. Before we get into it, this is from Chapter 2, Lesson 3. Um, which is called Fur Traders and Missionaries. And I just want to break up what our next few little in topics will be from this unit. So first we have the fur trade, specific focus on the Hudson Bay Company. Um, next we'll do early missionaries to Washington with a specific fo focus on the Whitman Massacre. And last, we're going to talk about the War of 1812, and that will conclude Chapter 2. Your assignment today is a short ed puzzle on fur traders in the western region. All right, let's jump in. So the fur trade technically began in the 1500s. And as we've talked about lots, Europeans loved hats made from beaver skins. But they had hunted the beaver to almost extinction in Europe. So really, really the Americans, Americas, Canada and the United States is where they were going to find beaver pelts. This is a beaver hat, as you know. This is what the rage was all about. It wasn't just this style, but this was the most common style. And it was the carriage class, the very fashionable, very wealthy to do that love these hats. And that's a modern beaver hat. So just a brief background, the fur trade was really promoted initially in the 1500s by the French. And here's a fun fact. They called it Canada. <laughs> and I'll talk about where that name comes from. But the French fur trappers were called coureurs des bois, or runners of the woods. And the word Canada itself, uh, its origins go back to 1535, when two Native American youths told French explorer Jacques Cartier about the route to Canada. And what Canada actually means is little village, village or settlement. And they were actually referring to a small town city, um, Stadacona, which is now Quebec. But they, they called it Canada, which has now become the whole country of Canada. It means village. So the French are adventurous woodsmen who traveled to New France, which is uh, part of North America at that time, now known as Canada. They paddle in canoes, specifically around the Hudson Bay area. We'll talk about where that is. And they traded European items for fur from Native Americans. Take a look up here. You can see some of the, some of the features of their clothing, of the early trappers. They often wore a red um, sash around their waist, white cotton shirt to protect from the sun and mosquitoes. And that's what they're hunting. They often take water routes um, and trapped a lot. Of course, beavers live by waters. Uh, so they were, they were around Great Lakes region and anywhere with a big waterway, that's where you're going to find the most pelts. About 300 years ago, Europeans bought beaver fur at a high price. They used the fur to make felt hats. So rich people could... Uh, they kept out water and cold. And I like this fun fact. 18 hats could be made from one beaver pelt. Women were a huge part of the trade, especially Native American women. And many, many, many um, French fur trappers married Native American wives. Uh, that's the case, of course, with Sacagawea and Marie Doran, who was on the Astoria expedition, they both had French fur trapping husbands. And women were essential to the camps because they would make clothing, gather firewood, make moccasins, snowshoes, they would do the cooking, etc. We'll talk more about this, but if you're wondering how they make those hats, out of beaver fur. It wasn't the top fur that you would see on the animal. It was the smaller fur underneath. 
They have very tight fur that's close to their skin, and that's the fur that would work as a felt. It's waterproof and it has, um, it's, it's hot, so it would make for a perfect hat. And again, 18 hats could be made from one beaver. So this guy right here, they'd be looking not at the long hairs, but at the short hairs underneath. This is just a primary source. This is an actual diary entry from a fur trapper. The Indians say the beaver is the animal most liked by the French, and the English is some by all European. One day I heard an Indian say the beaver makes all things perfectly well. It makes kettles, axes, swords, knives, bread, in fact, everything. My Indian friend told me one day, showing me a very handy knife. The English do not think right. They give us 20 knives like this for one beaver skin. What the Native American there is saying um, is that the beaver makes all things because they could trade what they thought was an unimportant resource, one beaver skin, for up to 20 knives. It's a good deal for the Native Americans at the time. So after the French, it's the English. And the English are the next group of people to get involved in the fur trade business. They specifically allied with the Iroquois Indians around the Great Lakes region. And this leads to a war called the Seven Years' War. And it's a war between France versus the English. And it's fought uh, primarily in the Great Lakes region of North America. And it was all about fur trapping. Who would control the Great Lakes region for trapping animals? Often called the Indian War. It's often also the Seven Years' War. But it ends with the Treaty of Paris in 1763. And it also cost Britain a lot of money. So even though England won, they now had many money problems from having to fight the French and the Native Americans. And that leads to the revolution, the American Revolution where we get our victory from Britain. It was because the British had had a fight over fur trading regions with the French. The British won, but it bankrupted and really hurt the British economy. So then they tried to tax the United States, the future United States Americans. We don't want to pay taxes. And so we had a revolution. So much of our revolution is in fact based on the fur trading business. Now we're going to talk about Hudson Bay and specifically the Hudson Bay Company. And this is Hudson Bay here. It's up in Canada. It's a huge region, and it's named after Sir Henry Hudson, who has a crazy story in and of itself. This is Henry Hudson, and he's an English sea explorer and navigator during the early 1600s. So he's famous for his explorations of Canada and parts of the United States. He made his first voyage west from England in 1607, and he was hired to find a short trade route to Asia from Europe through the Arctic Ocean, but was turned back due to ice. So he was actually going to go up over here through the Arctic, but he got turned back. And he landed in Hudson Bay, which was frozen over. And he decides that he is going to uh, let his ship freeze in the bay for the winter. He knew it would become trapped in ice, and then he figured they would just spring when the ice thawed Henry Hudson and his crew would sail away except his crew had enough of him they hated his decision making they rebelled and they actually put him and seven other men as well as his son on a small boat and when the ice thawed they just left them and nobody ever saw Henry Hudson or his son ever again but he gets a huge body of water named after him and later the Hudson Bay Company is formed. So it's not formed by Henry Hudson, but it's named after the bay that's named after him. And it's this whole area here was called Rupert's Land, and this uh, was named after a French royalty. And this whole area is where the fur trapping business starts. And then, of course, they're trying to make their way here. You can see Washington right down here, but they're trying to make their way across to Washington um, and the Pacific Northwest, constantly in search of new furs. Now, quick little fun fact. If we jump back to this, 
this area right here, uh, this will be short, but it was a French settlement area of fur trapping. And there was about 10,000 French in the region of what is now Maine. And the British actually moved in after the war, um, the Seven Years' War, the British decided that they needed to get rid of all these French fur trappers and this French colonies and the French farmers, and they moved them south, where they ended up getting deported down to Louisiana, and they became the Cajuns. Uh, so Cajuns are actually displaced French fur trappers um, and French colonists that the British made move uh, to the Louisiana Territory, and of course Cajuns are now famous in New Orleans for both their music and Cajun food. And still Cajun, Cajuns around today. So the big significance of fur trapping for the Native Americans, in a sense it was positive, especially initially, because natives traded beaver pelts for items like knives, hatchets, rifles, pistols, and they were able to get household items, blankets, kettles, pots, beads, buttons, cloths, scissors, spoons, shoes, and it improved their life in many ways. The negative, however, is of course many of those blankets, whether intentionally or not, had um, European diseases like measles, smallpox, bubonic plague, tuberculosis, and influenza. And it ended up spreading the diseases across the North American continent that killed millions of Native Americans. Um, and in some cases, Native Americans who never even saw trappers or white people or Europeans, you know, one blanket could travel back to a tribe and result in the death of many. For the Europeans, the positive is that it really expanded their knowledge of the continent. They learn about Native North American crops such as corn, potatoes, and squash. Those are all things that are native to our country. They didn't exist in Europe. Um, they also learned about the geography of North America. And the original maps of our country were all made, almost all made by Native American, or by um, fur trapping, fur trappers. All right, so we're going to talk about the Hudson Bay Company. And the Hudson Bay Company that I mentioned previously, the impact on Washington was that they actually came here in 1824 and they built a fort uh, in what is now Vancouver, Washington. They named it Fort Vancouver. So again, this is a company that goes back to the 1600s and they're still around today. There's still Hudson Bay companies up in um, stores, in malls up in Canada and some in quite a few in the United States as well, mostly known for their sweaters. So they built a fort uh, in Vancouver, Washington in 1824 it was built by this man, Mr. John McLaughlin, he's mentioned in your textbook, who is also known as the father of Oregon. Um, this was the first large settlement. So you have Fort Astoria, where Astoria, Oregon is in 1810, and then 1824 you have Fort Vancouver, but Vancouver was more successful. So the Hudson Bay Company had expanded into being uh, several buildings and hundreds of residents. And of course, there's some famous great stories about individual fur trappers uh, in Washington and in the Northwest. John Coulter, Jim Bridger, Kit Carson, Jedediah Smith, um, James Beckworth, Joseph Walker from Northern California up to our great state of Washington. Uh, some very famous fur trappers in this area. Maybe none as famous, we'll end with this, as John Coulter, who was seen as the first American fur trapper um, he was actually on the Lewis and Clark expedition, and on the way back, he asked Lewis if he could stay in the Rockies and continue to hunt beaver. Um, he wanted to get in on the fur trapping business, so he was given a leave of absence because it was a military expedition. He was given a leave of absence, and he hunted mostly in Idaho and Montana. We can talk more about him at our meet, but he's a very famous fur trapper and probably the most famous story of his is what they call Coulter's Run. And Coulter's Run, the short version, and I'll tell you again, I'll, I'll go into it more at our Google Meet, but that's where he teams up with John Potts, who was another member of the Lewis and Clark expedition who came out to find him. Um, Coulter was out in the wilderness for a while hunting by himself. And Potts and Coulter teamed up, but in 1809, they were attacked um, by hundreds of Blackfeet Indians, Native Americans. 
and Potts was actually killed, and Coulter was <laughs> stripped by the Blackfeet and told to run, and they hunted him. Um, he ends up surviving. He ends up killing one of the Native American braves, and he wanders for 11 days, barefoot and naked, back to uh, a fort where he is saved, and he continues to go back out in the wilderness as a fur trapper. All right, that's a little bit about fur trapping, um, kind of a quick history and some background on it, and it's a little bit about some of the fur trappers and their forts in Washington. Thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed 7th Graders, and as always, if you have any questions, send me an email, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.